Welcome. I'm Nikki Young, Program Manager with the Child Neurology Foundation. Today's talk is part of our ongoing series on epilepsy management. Each topic focuses on what we heard from our partners and our families as a top priority. So today, we're discussing seizure action plans and seizure rescue medications. I'm joined by Dr. Jeff Buckhalter. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Do you mind to just share a little bit about your background and your experience in this space? Thank you, Nikki, and thanks to the Child Neurology Foundation for uh, allowing me to participate in this educational series. I've been a child neurologist for about 35 years, uh, specializing in children with difficult to control epilepsy. Uh, this is a, a timely um, uh, presentation because the Epilepsy Foundation has collaborated with others in doing a survey of when care providers, doctors, educators, people with epilepsy, and parents um, think about cluster seizures and seizure action plans. And that'll be in the, uh, available in the literature in the next couple months. Wonderful, wonderful. And we've got tons of great resources we're linking to this um, video as well. So look for those at the end. Um, so great. So Dr. Buckholder, thank you again for being here. Um, so we're going to cover some of the kind of the most frequently asked questions regarding seizure action plans. Um, but also before this recording, we reached out to our audience to see what questions um, families may have specifically around this, these topics. So just to dive right in, um, one parent actually asked that for their newly diagnosed child, um, what does a seizure action plan include and why is it important for them to have one? So uh, this is a really great question because it, it asks directly what's in a seizure action plan, what is it, and why is it important for people to have it and when, because this parent is asking about a newly diagnosed child. Um, so a seizure action plan is a document that's intended for use when a child or an adult has a seizure. It answers the question, what do we do then? Very simple question. Uh, the document is the product of a conversation between the healthcare provider and the patient or the parent, uh, uh, healthcare uh, parent uh, and, and patient if possible. Um, it's, it's constructed based on the age of the child, the type of seizures, the frequency, as well as the consequences of having a seizure. So that if not breathing is a consequence, you really uh, want to have a very clear idea of what you're gonna do. Now, usually it applies to first seizures uh, happening in the home environment. What do you do if you're the parent at home? But commonly it's written for use by school personnel. Some schools require it. It's extremely useful to have on hand when emergency medical services, 911 arrives, having it for the emergency department where the child is transported to. Um, so the basic things that a seizure action plan contains is the name of the child, their age, the medical record number, if it's going to one institution, their current physician, what medications uh, they've taken, taken in the past and in the present, what works, what doesn't work, and of course, do they have any allergies? So this is pretty standard stuff that's sort of across, across the top. Um, the trick is it needs to be individualized to a specific patient as no two people are the same. And that's what makes it uh, a little difficult. Although some of the boxes are, are sort of uh, cookie cutter, uh, what goes in them depends on the person and their history. So what do you do in, diff in different situations? Um, the first situation is a typical seizure that probably occurs at home, stops by itself uh, in the usual or acceptable period of time. And, and the reason I want to emphasize acceptable is that there's a tendency to use the same number for everybody. And frequently it's five minutes. 
But if someone doesn't come back to normal till 10, seven minutes, that's fine. If they usually get up in two minutes, by the time you're out to five, so that is uh, definitely abnormal. In this first case, what you do is basic seizure first aid, which every parent should know that involves turning a child on his or her side, making sure the airway is clean, not putting anything in the mouth, and, and, and so forth. Uh, it can then be followed by, do we call anybody? Do we call the doctor's office? Do we call the emergency room? And again, that can be resolved with the seizure action plan by writing it down. So for kids with a lot of seizures, the doctor's office can hear about it the next day if everything is back to normal. If it's a very unusual occurrence, they may want to hear about it immediately. And then we get to the situation uh, where the seizure does not stop by itself. It just keeps on going, it lasts too long. And one may need to start what's called rescue therapy. Again, this is something that's prescribed. The family will have at home or at school. Uh, and along with the medication and the dosage, there might also be instruction to repeat it after a few minutes if things are not better. Again, step by step written down. Uh, now, I just want to say that at any point, the, the seizure action plan may recommend calling EMS uh, or the parent or the caregiver if they're outside the home. You know, the, when in doubt, call 911. There's a situation that I referred to earlier where the seizure doesn't last too long, but it's repetitive over and over and over again. And these are referred to as seizure clusters or cluster seizures. Same, same thing. The seizure action plan describes what to do uh, in this situation. And it may be um, something that the school nurse does or maybe something that EMS does. But again, it's in the plan. Um, the issue of when it should be developed, and this goes to the question of the newly diagnosed uh, individual, um, varies tremendously in the medical community. And I'm sad to say that a lot of people, children and adults, uh, never have it discussed or get a seizure action plan. So um, there's a lot of variation there. So why is it important? It's important to have a seizure action plan uh, because care providers need a clear path, a plat, excuse me, a clear plan as to what to do, not only to reduce anxiety, uh, but to provide guidance in a potentially life-threatening situation. Well, and you mentioned some of the places that a family would bring a seizure action plan. And I think that's important as well to make sure that everyone that is caring for the child knows what to do in, in the event of a seizure. Um, so for, for, especially for this newly diagnosed child, um, if you're looking for a seizure action plan, I don't know how to build one. Um, CNF has uh, two resources on our website. One is just a seizure action plan. And then we have one that's specific for schools. So right. and, um, we'll, we'll also mention a lot of other great resources too. But, um, so you mentioned a little bit about um, seizure rescue therapy, and so I'd like to talk more about um, seizure rescue medications. So what, what are those, and how are they administered usually? So the most commonly used rescue medications are in the so-called benzodiazepine family, and, and, and these are the common ones like Valium, diazepam, lorazepam, midazolam, and clomazam. And those are all medicines that are used for rescue therapy. Now, the issue of administration uh, is, is really, really important because there's a variety of, of routes. Uh, and these include rectal, oral, and more recently, nasal sprays. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize in this regard 
is whatever medicine is prescribed, uh, it should be weight-based in children as it, as it normally is. Uh, and folks need to realize that one of the most common reasons for rescue therapy not being effective is because people don't give the appropriate dose. Mm. Parents and emergency medical services say, I'm afraid to give it because I'm afraid they're going to stop breathing, which is, a, which is a known side effect of some of these medications. However, the literature is very clear. It's more likely for a child or an adult to stop breathing because of the seizure, not because of the medication. So if you want to stop to keep breathing, which of course uh, we all do, it's important to give the proper dosage and to make sure that emergency medical services does the same. So for a for a parent, caregiver, for the school, anyone that's in charge of the child, when when do they give the seizure rescue medication? Um, and do they need to take the child to the emergency room after they've done it? The answer to these questions um, is the Caesar action plan. Because uh, when, you know, witnessing a seizure is a terrifying uh, uh, kind of thing. And as someone who's been watching these for decades, I get scared every time I see one. They're really, really frightening. And so having a seizure action plan is a way to get over that anxiety because you know what to do. And so you follow the seizure action plan. Uh, sometimes folks are tempted to wait in the hope that it'll just stop by itself. This should be discussed with the prescribing physician and then you go with the plan. Now, the question of whether or not to go to the emergency room uh, is another one of those things that needs to be individualized because folks are very, very different. Uh, if the seizure does not stop, then it's highly likely that EMS uh, will have been called and they most likely are going to transport to the ER. Uh, if there's concern about vomiting or not breathing, that's another good reason to go to the emergency room because that vomit can get in the lungs. Um, on the other hand, for those seizures that stop after a rescue therapy has been administered and there's no history of it recurring based on similar episodes in the past, then the decision to go to the ER is more difficult, but a lot of parents in that circumstance uh, will, will stay home because they know their child is going to be okay. Again, best discussed with the care provider, the physician, and, and recorded in the seizure action plan. Thank you. So um, one last question for you. So we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but who should be responsible for creating the seizure action plan? Well, I want to tell the listeners of this, uh, this, this segment that that was my question. Uh, who is responsible? And the answer is traditionally, it was the responsibility uh, of the healthcare provider to make sure that it was done. So if the doctor or the nurse um, didn't create one, didn't bring it up, it didn't get done. And that's and, and I'm saying that uh, with great embarrassment. Uh, we're now living in a time where there's you know greater expectation and allowance of, of patient and parent caregiver uh, engagement. And so that as, as individuals become more knowledgeable uh, about seizures and optimal care, I think it is completely reasonable for the patient or the parent to bring this to the attention of the healthcare provider to get a seizure action plan. Um, and, and, you know, it will, in most cases be very well received if the parent or the patient says, I've heard about this, I know it's important. Here's actually one from the Child Neurology Foundation. Could we fill that out together? So take action. Awesome, great. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Buckhalter, for providing your expertise to the child neurology community. Um, as mentioned, for more resources and some of the resources that we, we mentioned during our discussion, check out CNF's website at childneurologyfoundation.org. And together, we are all child neurology.